Hello, everyone. Welcome to this first edition of 2022 of The Agronomists. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and hats off to producer Jay Strovey, who surprised us all with some new intro music, some new countdown music. So uh, thank you to Jay. Um, it had me dancing in my seat and uh, everyone Good evening. Welcome here. Thanks for all the comments. It was a surprise to me too. So, so far we've got most, most votes are four. There's a few against and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how this goes. Okay. Before I bring in my guests, um, I did, of course, it is the first show of 2022. Thank you all for joining us uh, after our two week break. Did want to send a shout out to, of course, our show sponsor, Adama Canada, and to Real Ag Radio and Mind Your Farm Business. Uh, Adama Canada, while other sources of innovation run dry, Adama is here to deliver. L leveraging the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative crop protection solutions to your greatest challenges. We're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today or visit adama.com. All right, uh, we're going to get into this. I do want to mention, of course, there are CEU credits available for following along and watching tonight. We do hope uh, you do more than just that, though. Of course, we do love the questions, the comments, and uh, I hope you give our two guests tonight a run for their money. We've got lots to talk about. Now, I did want to very quickly, I haven't seen Jim Hale on here yet, but we are talking planters versus seeders. But I wanted to remind him the name of the show is The Agronomists not the wrenchers. And so we will be talking about agronomy considerations, not so much the mechanical stuff, mostly because the host doesn't know what she's talking about. All right. So before, uh, before I get too carried away, um, and Warren has a question for one of our guests already, but we'll ask it when he's here. So uh, join me in welcoming Doug Moisey. He's an agronomist out of Central Alberta for Pioneer Seeds Canada and Horse Bonner, our soybean specialist here in Ontario. Welcome, Doug. Welcome, Horst. How are the two of you? Well, I think we're great, Lindsay. Uh, I, 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 for one, am all for the music. Back to 1972. Why not? Let's go back in time. That was great. <laughs> oh, there you go, Doug. How are you? Doing good. We finally come out of the defreeze, so things are beginning to unthaw, and now I feel like putting on the old disco boots and going for a dance. <laughs> I would like someone in the comments to share photos of said disco boots. Um, but <laughs> we'll see. I'm sure Ray, Ray could. I bet you he's got that on his phone. Um, all right. Now I did, Doug, I did want to ask, and I was going to maybe play a game today of who is in the coldest spot in Canada. And I was kind of thinking you would win, but you've, you're telling me it's already warmed up. So, so what was the deep freeze and where are you guys at now? Uh, we hit a low of minus 50 with the wind chill here the other morning. Uh, we were probably in the low 40s most of the last week here, and finally we're at minus 21 here. So and we're getting there. Feels balmy, right? It yeah, is. I spoke to someone else it's... today at, at minus 15. Feels warm after that kind of cold. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to complain. So yeah, so our <laughs> Doug, our, our Ontario audience is uh, an oh my and a yikes, I would say. And Horst uh, Warren Schneckenberger does want to ask, why are you not on Twitter? Oh, Warren, stop already. Let's have a nice evening together. Can we somehow just exclude Warren from this, kick him off? Absolutely hey, can you do not. That for us? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, he is he is here every Monday and we appreciate it. And he even got a hat. So no, Warren is staying. Okay. okay. Um yeah, don't worry, Warren. Just Horst comes on our show and on the soybean school, and then we share that on Twitter. And it's like you're on Twitter, right? So close enough. All right. Okay. So yes, we are talking planter versus cedar. Um, we're going to focus mostly on canola and soybeans, of course, with our with our specialists here uh, tonight. Um, so we do have a couple clips. I think we'll get to at least one of them, maybe two of them. Two of them are very short, so maybe I will actually get to them. But what I want to talk about uh, this evening, and Horst, you've done a lot of work on this. Doug, you were, you've, I mean, got a lot of experience on this, on all the things that change not just you know how good of a job we do at establishment but all the things that follow after that point and how that can change with the planter versus cedar so uh doug i'll start with you we're focused on canola obviously this year maybe too dry to even get a crop in a in a lot of senses but what is the general feeling sort of in your neck of the woods as to as to how interested farmers are in moving more canola acres under a planter 
Well, I, I think to start off with, there is a lot of discussion, uh, especially in some of the dry areas, but where guys are looking at potentially getting better overall establishment. Um, some of the guys that I'm dealing with right now that are exploring planters or have used planters do like the idea of pre precision placement. Uh, they're lowering their seeding rates because ideally what they're doing is that they're getting that ideal spacing about a plant every one inch. They're getting good depth control, uh, but there are some downfalls to that too as well. And so there's a lot of uh, open discussion on that right now and more, some of it is from precision placement, but also from the fact is that with some of the drills that are out there right now, guys are dealing with is the fact is that it's flowing of seed. We see a lot of clumping of seed every year in fields where you'll see eight or nine plants clump together, then six inches or eight inches row where there's nothing. And this is in some respects looks at a lot of guys look at this as a waste of seed. And I would agree. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it's going to come back down to is also timing and commitment where some of these guys have got a lot of acres to put in the ground. They're not going to spend as much time using a planter just because it is a little bit slower. Uh, typically the widths aren't there when we're talking, some guys here are, running 50 feet of drill sometimes or 70, you know, averages in that 40. But for them, it's, that is one of the issues. And then we start looking at fertilizer with the seed or, you know, seed placement of fertilizer. And there's a lot of ongoing discussion. Um, there's a lot more movement, but we also have some guys that are moving away from a planter as well and going back to a drill because they've just seen how much extra work is involved with a planter. And so time is time is money in in, in Alberta, especially. Mm -hmm. Now, Horst, how would you feel if uh, one of your your growers here said that they were going to move to a 70 foot drill? What do you well, think? Wouldn't, that be, wouldn't that be something? Uh, yeah, we're certainly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No, there's there's lots to lots to be said about efficiency, though, isn't there? No matter what piece of equipment you've got. And and that is really what modern agriculture is about. Efficiency. Fast, fast, fast. Like a lot of these growers that we work with, you know, they want to have all their soybeans planted in a stretch of four, maybe five days. You've got to get a lot of work done. So that certainly comes into the equation. But I would say the biggest driver in Ontario really has been, and, and most of the U.S. really, of course, is just seed cost, right? Seed cost keeps going up. And with soybeans, it's, it's one of our biggest expenses when you consider the you know the technology and then of course the the seed treatments on top of that so there are some real reasons to try and minimize your seeding rate and, and precision precision planting is part of that right mm -hmm. now now Doug I mean that certainly has also been a consideration in recent years for sure and and I think for many farmers has been a bit of a, a draw for doing a better job so they can potentially save on seed but but that, of course, also brings with it its own level of, well, first of all, investment of a planter, but also brings with potentially a level of risk with canola as well. Yeah, it, it does. Uh, when you start looking at most planters that are sold in the marketplace, especially in Western Canada, uh, if you, unless you're willing to buy brand new, you're looking at anywhere from a 22 inch to a 30, 30 inch or, th or sorry, 36 inch row spacing. Where that plays, especially here in Alberta, is we only have so many growing days without frost. And typically as canola gets allowed to have more space, you get more branching. Your main yield now is on all your branches and typically they're the last to mature. And so we've seen actually in parts along the Highway 2 corridor where guys have gone to planters on 15 inch spacings and doing not bad. But what they see is a couple of downfalls to that is, yes, they, well, I guess the positive is, they are lowering their seeding rate. They're getting better overall even emergence. The downfall is typically it's another application of a herbicide just because of days to ground cover. And then they start looking at two and three days later in maturity, which can mean the difference between a number one or a number two canola. So there's mm -hmm. these trade-offs. And I know of a couple of uh, customers that I've talked to that have had planters that are not for sale just because they said the extra workload using a planter in their neck of the woods is just not beneficial considering you know, environment, spraying. And when we start looking at the way herbicide shortages are this year, we're going to have to really watch our timing of spring. And then it's that whole idea is that until canola covers ground, it's not a fierce competitor, very much like soybeans, until it can get that ground mm -hmm. cover. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, I, 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 oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, you've done 
plenty of work around these things of, of row spacing depth. And we're going to look into some of that, but, but yeah, to add to, to Doug's comment. Yeah, I was just going to say the growers that I know that in Ontario here that have moved, now I'm talking about soybeans, have moved from a drill to a planter, including, you know, in the research that I, I do, I, I, I went to a planter about 13 years ago. And, and personally, I would never think of going back to a drill. I mean, you couldn't, uh, you could talk all day long, and you wouldn't convince me for, for a minute to go back. Uh, it's just, it's a beautiful thing to see those individual rows come up. You have more plants per acre uh, come up compared to what you actually seeded, more even and consistent stand. Now I'm in 15 inch rows. The only growers that I'm aware of that shifted back to a drill, because we have, you know, that, that issue uh, of winter wheat or um, uh, uh, an air seeder would be really far north that weren't happy with, the 15 inch row and felt that the seven and a half inch row was giving them a little bit more but you really have to go pretty far north here for that to be true for most of ontario 15s are just fine right mm -hmm. see here in alberta we we have guys that are seeding soybeans and we, we we as a company we have that we have soybeans but long story short uh, a lot of the guys are seeing more success in our neck of the woods using a solid seeding system like a, a drill and the reason is it's just ground cover and it's plants. Yeah. But, but the whole idea here is that they've also bumped their seeding rate from a typical 180,000 plants per acre to 220 to get that, you know, get that ground cover up. Because, again, it's that covering of the ground. So, mm -hmm. you know, in our northern geographies, we just find on the row spacings, the, the soybeans hang out a little bit farther in maturity than what we want. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and, I mean, and go ahead. No, there's a, there's a lot to be said about getting the canopy closed. You know, we, we talk a lot about getting it fully closed by full flower R2, but certainly by early pod set in terms of a yield perspective. Now, this is not with respect to weeds and ground cover. You know, this is just from a yield sunlight perspective. By early pod set, you want that full canopy. And so generally, you know, when, when a grower um, asks me, is it okay to go to 30 inch rows? I say, can you get that canopy closed? And for some of them, the answer is absolutely yes, they can. They're on pretty nice loamy soils, very productive ground. They can plant early and they have a considerable number of heat units, right? I mean, you know, they're kind of London South or maybe right along along the border and th those growers can get away with 30 inch rows but the rest of us start to lose some yield and and that's what you're getting at you know i i certainly out west that makes a lot of sense to me to stay pretty tight yeah now we are getting some really good comments and questions come in and so jason now jason vote's got a question here uh, because of course part of this is all about the plant not just the seed but the seed that makes it to the ground and is alive and comes up and then comes up uniformly. And so mm. Jason's asking the question about, of course, how much does airflow and velocity contribute to mortality in canola and soybeans and planters versus drill? So Doug, I'll, I'll maybe start with you. When we're talking canola, that is a big consideration in an air drill, is it not? It is, and this is where I give the two thumbs up to a, a planter situation when it comes to canola. Typically, you've got the air system. There's a vacuum system. It's, it's binding to a plate. It gets knocked off. It's a very precise system of dropping seed down. The problem that we do have with the air drill system here is, is that typically most, and I'm sorry, guys, the farmers that are on here, most of you guys set fan speed so you don't plug with fertilizer because you're trying to move fertilizer and seed at the same time. A couple of things that can happen. You can adjust dampering systems, but typically that seed is going to experience some damage as it travels along the system unless it's a direct link right to the opener um now this is a long time ago but we did some data with some of the older air drills that had towers and we could lose 20 percent germination from the bag going through the drill out to the seed because we did some tests where we collected seed at the opener and we could drop 20 percent germ just because of the cracked and damage as it went through the tower system now the newer drills very nice uh they've got a better direct system but there still is some damage going through and if you start throwing fertilizer in with that that fertilizer starts acting can act a little bit like a battering ram on that seed um mm -hmm. 
but we typically most farmers in western canada that i deal with that when they're setting fan speed they set one speed and they set it so they don't plug the fertilizer and the one thing is is that with these drills and the way moisture humidity we've got to be constantly adjusting fan speed through the day because we want to prevent seed bounce we want precision placement and for guys that are into pear growth system if you've got too much air you could be putting seed right down the middle of the row which again then destroys your seed survivability at the end of the day so mm -hmm. and wow. this is where I yeah. corn planters, like corn planters in my mind that's where they have the big win situation Oh, it looks like it froze up there. Um, yeah. I, I, that's I would that's why I do like a corn planter in that there case because it does add to that. Yeah. Go ahead, Horst. I, I would just make a comment that yeah. in, in the soybean world, so much comes down to seed quality when you're talking about damage going through any kind of any kind of a air drill or even a conventional drill, right? Um, if the seed quality is good, we don't have a lot of problems with that. Um, you know, we, we, we can bang up soybean seed to, you know, a reasonable extent if the quality is good. But if it's a year where, you know, it was real dry in the fall or, you know, just a lot of wet, dry cycles in the fall and that seed quality is poor, yeah, for sure. You got to be more gentle with the seed and you can lose uh, quite a percentage, right? Um, I, I don't know about 20%. The work that I've seen has been more in the range of five to maybe 8% uh, that, mm -hmm. that in, in the soybean world, right? Yes, in soybeans. Yeah, canola are kind of teeny. Now, uh, Warren, your nemesis, uh, has said that he's uh, he's been at 15 inch drilled beans for a long time and he's ready to pull the trigger on a 36 r 20 planter how will 20 inch rows compare to the 15s so a 15 inch row versus a 20 inch row if you are using the same piece of equipment warren i'm quite let's just use that argument the same piece of equipment i think we would have a very hard time measuring any yield difference uh statistically the number would probably be zero Right. I mean, if you did 100 trials, maybe it's 0.2 bushels, something crazy small like that, um, because we, we know because we've done seven and a half, 15s and 30 inch work. Right. So we know and we have 20s, too, from the University of Guelph quite a while ago. So I would say to Warren, I, I'm, I'm all for going to a planter, like I've said earlier. And there's nothing wrong with a 20 inch roll where he is. If I was in northern Bruce County, I'd be a little bit more worried but where he is no problem uh, i think that's the way to go and 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 i would be amazed the only um i would be amazed if you're disappointed with that the only way i could see that you 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 might um uh have to change your your system a little bit is if it's a real weedy year you know you got lots of moisture early on you might just see a few more weeds try to poke their th head through because of that little bit of a wider roll. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, he does add that he's planted 30s the last few years and happy with the placement and establishment, but 30s are so stressful for weed control. So, so hmm. that would be, I mean, even more so, right? So, and shout out to Jim Hale who did make it. Uh, Jim, you missed my um, announcement at the outset, which was this is about agronomy with planters versus cedars, not the planters and cedars themselves um so if you want to talk about wrenching on things you can go somewhere else anyway okay so just kidding oh we can talk about that too um all right so dave dr dave hooker asked a great question and i'm going to sort of morph this in for both of you not just about um planter versus drill on same row with for for soybeans but same similar question or what we've been talking about optimal seeding rates for planter versus drill on the same row width so how do you decide um how you adjust for things based on the same row row width for a planter versus cedar it's like an interesting question well i mean i, I can start i can start with that on the soybean side so the the work that we did we had about 35 site years where we compared uh, a planter to a drill and, and seven and a half 15s in in both the planter and the drill and at the end of the day we had 5% more plants come out of the ground in 15 inch rows planted versus 15 inch rows drilled. So Dave, my answer would be that that is 
the number, about 5%, you can reduce your seeding rate um, <clears throat> when you compare it the exact same row. Um, now, part of it, you know, is going to depend, obviously, a little bit on travel speed. I think uh, there are some of these problems that when we get into trying to get uh, a lot of work done, I think we push these pieces of equipment a little bit too much and you start to lose uh, really the performance of either a drill or a planter, unless it's a high speed planter, right? Mm. Yeah, Jack, so, any thoughts well, on yes, that? I mean, uh, maybe, maybe I can just finish up on that but before I forget. Dave asked for a specific number. So Dave, our number is still 165,000 seeds per acre. If it has a seed treatment, a fungicide seed treatment with a planter in 15 inch rows, and 177 in a drill, right? That's how kind of our number shook out when we looked at that whole whole data set and a little bit more for, for seven and a half, so we're at 194 still. But uh, we, we actually are trying to redo some of that work and, and Dave is part of that. We're gonna have a few years of, of uh, different, different um, varieties and seeding rates to try and reassess some of that work. Yeah, so Doug, um, I'll put it to you, um, you know, on seeding rate. Although I think with canola, so often we start with the, what is your optimal plant stand you want to end up with and work backwards, right? So well, similar and, and Yeah, you, you hit it right on the head, Lindsay. Um, in the ideal world, if you can have five to six plants per square foot, even coming up nicely and the world is good, that's where your ideal yield is. Uh, you can take advantage of genetics, everything else. It's when we start getting below that. And what the research did when I was with the Canola Council, but the research done by Egg Canada is showing that when you get down into four plants per square foot or less, your yield variability starts to change based upon weed control, moisture, just the whole world changes. The advantage that canola does have is it's a very, very plastic plant. Um, if you get there and it's given a lot of room, it gets big and bushy. I remember a long time ago, one of the companies put out a challenge about how many pods could you get in a plant. Well, you know, when we did it with the Canola Council, we were down to one plant per square foot and we could get as much as 500 pods on a plant. So it's just the maturity starts to drift. So in my world on a 15 inch row spacing, we're still looking that we want to have at least 10 plants per row of foot coming up. And, and the reason is, is that, that if you start equating that back into 10 inch spacings per square foot, it gets you into that eight number. And I still like seven to eight plants at first pass of herbicide um, per square foot. That gives you some room to breathe. Anything above that, you're basically with the newer hybrids, you're choking yourself out. But with a with a corn planter, typically it works out about a seed every inch and a quarter on a 15 inch row spacing. That's where you want to be at, or a plant every inch and a, inch and a quarter, inch and a half, and then adjust mm -hmm. accordingly. Now, with a planter, seed survivability will probably go up a lot more. You could probably because of precision depth control, um, you're not putting any fertilizer with the seed, and hopefully you're going to warm soils. You could probably get above 75 percent survivability whereas typically with the drill we say about 70 percent survivability in western canada there are guys that are higher consistently but they're paying attention at seeding time they're slowing down they're watching depth they're watching fertility with the seed they're watching soil temperature doing all the little things right uh, in my world the biggest killer to a canola plant is depth and speed if you're going too fast and you can't control the depth you're killing canola you know mm-hmm Absolutely. It is a teeny little seed. And actually, Horst has got some uh, great visuals on, on some of that. Maybe um, maybe we'll switch gears just a little bit. And Jay, uh, producer Jay, if you could bring up, let's talk about seeding depth just a little. Um, and so we'll, we'll go to some of Horst's slides. And maybe, Horst, you can talk us through what some of these things are. We do. I know we, we've got some on row width, uh, but also on, on depth. So, so let's uh, look into those, too. Yeah, absolutely. So this picture is just seven and a half inch rows and some of the, the problems we get into on our clay soils with poor stands. And, you know, this is not uh, all that unusual, especially on, on a tougher part of the field, right? And the next picture shows that if you go into a little bit wider rows, 
the beans actually will help each other push out, right? That's part of the, the, the wonder of, the, of the, the incredible push that they have. And if you get a few helping each other out, and of course, the more you have in the role, the more they can help each other up. And so to, to the point of seeding depth, the next picture really demonstrates, uh, these are just one row plots. And you can see I, I put the seed right on the surface all the way to four inches deep. This is with my 15 inch row unit uh, vacuum planter. And you can clearly see that once you get past two inches there, especially three and three and a half, the stand just falls apart. And that's really dug to your point in canola. I'm sure if you did something similar, it would be even more extreme that that precise planting for soybeans is important. And so a planter, no question, does a better job when it comes to seed depth as well as putting the seed evenly down the row. And uh, just to put some numbers to it, the next slide here shows the actual, you know, plants per acre of two varieties. And you can see at three inches there, we really fell apart. And this is was even planted in June when, when the soil was considerably warmer than, you know, some of our late April or May planting, just to prove the point that even when soils are warm, and you're looking for moisture, there is a, there's kind of a maximum depth that you can go to for, for um, best soybean stands. And so those couple of slides right there drive you to think, well, maybe there is something to uh, using a planter compared to a drill, right? And mm -hmm. the, next, uh, the next slide here, we'll just move along real quick. Uh, again, you know, trying to hone in on what the ideal planting depth is for soybeans. And we've always talked about an inch and a half, and now we have some really good data that shows that uh, the average there, 62.2 bushels compared to 58.8 if you're planting two and a half inches deep. You know, that's that's a significant both statistical and, and, and uh, you know, in your pocket kind of difference to, to show those kind of differences from planting um, is is uh, nothing to sneeze at because it just it just shows how what we do in the spring really does matter and having that precision. So these again were in 15 inch rows with that vacuum planter, and we did do some actual trials. This, these are about 10 years ago. If you go to the next slide here, um, where we tried to assess, you know, here you've got a row seated with the drill. And you can see that one plant has already got a trifoliate starting to come out and the middle plant there, you know, it's just barely out of the ground. Does that kind of a difference in emergence have any impact on final yield? Well, okay, maybe. Let's go to the next picture. And of course the question, you know, that uh, Doug already brought up with canola clumping or holes on the other side because if you're clumping on one end you've also got a hole on the somewhere else because that seed just isn't spread evenly does does that matter and that's very typical for for a drill um especially in a no-till kind of world and then uh you know when we we get into these bigger spacings like the next picture shows sometimes when there's some residue or whatever in your and your drill isn't able to push that out of the way, this is obviously a no-till, uh, those kind of holes do start to hurt, especially if they're over an inch. And at the end of the day, you know, clearly um, we showed in the next couple of slides here that um, a drill, you need a certain minimum number of plants, right? And that's where we come up with our seeding recommendation. There is that that um, gradual increase in yield as you increase seeding rates and then you put your economics to it. And so that's where we come up with that 194 for a seven and a half inch drill. But if you look at the same seeding rates of 100 and 200,000 in the next slide and 15 inch drill in a 15 inch drill compared to a seven and a half, Here's the problem, and I, you know, the Doug hit on a little bit with canola too. We, we, we start to lose a little bit of yield. In soybeans, it's not much. It's only about a bushel for us to go to 15s in a drill, 
okay, well, that's the last thing we want to do, right? We want to go up the yield curve. So the next slide shows that if you use a planter in the same, with the same seeding rate, um, that was our best scenario, you know, 53 bushels compared to 51. And, and that's the whole story there. So is it, is it a huge benefit, all these things we've talked about? No, but it is a measurable, real benefit. And that's why I kind of made that pretty strong statement at the beginning. You're not going to get me to go back to a drill. Uh, I love the planter. It, it's just, it's just more consistent. Mm -hmm. Now, now, Doug, though, we, I mean, when I'm looking at some of these images that Horst is sharing, I know that, you know, we, we have done with the Canola Council and we've done with our Canola School, um, a, a similar sort of comparison, but really it was about speed because yeah. we were looking at air drills, not necessarily planters, but air drills, because that's what most farmers have, um, that you, that a big part of controlling that depth and consistent depth is the driver's speed. Can you oh, talk us through that? Well, and, and for sure, and and the reason why speed is, and a number of years ago, it was looked at by Neil Harker, speed, seeding speed, because when you start to look at, and I'm going to pull back a little bit of history here, some of the best crops we had in Western Canada is when we were on summer follow, we were using old whole press drills where you could only go two and a half miles an hour, very precision for that time of year. Now with the bigger drills where you're looking at 40 to 60 to 70 feet, there, even if it's a parallel system or something or independent, the bottom line is you still got a lot of moving parts. And when you start bumping up speed, what happens is you start to see that you actually see the seeding tool start to rise and follow through the field. And one of the things I've tried to encourage a lot of guys, you want to see how much movement you got is on the very outside of your wing of your drill on your seeding tool, put a five gallon pail of water and put about, fill it about half four or three quarters. And how far down the field can you go before you empty it? And you'd be quite surprised how quickly you can empty it. Um, and it's just that whole idea with speed is, is that it doesn't allow, at the factory go, it doesn't allow the machine to do its job, whether it's from properly setting depth control to actually allowing proper amount of seed to be put through to actually land in the proper spot. And then the on-road packing part. Um, now, there are disc drills out there that guys have successfully seeded on certain types of land, five, five and a half, six miles an hour. Not a big issue but you get them into other scenarios where your soil types are maybe a little bit different. Um, you know, just they get this whole idea of like what's going on with your soil type, uh, what you're doing for trash. All of a sudden that five and six miles an hour becomes a detriment to that crop. And mm -hmm. to me, my philosophy has been for the last number of years, the difference between a good canola crop and a bad canola crop emerging on the ground, sometimes is six is three feet. And that's a distance from the front of the steering wheel to the back of the seat. And that's because is that guys are in a rush to get going. And so sometimes it's just slowing down, taking the time. When you think about it, um, when we did some work here, this was a few years ago, but we had a guy go three, four, and five miles an hour. The variation of depth could go from anywhere from a quarter inch difference in depth to as much as an inch and a half just by going up a mile an hour on this guy's land. We have to wait for the <coughs> to travel. Oh no. Maybe he has to sneeze. Okay, Doug, we'll wait for you to come back. Actually, now is probably a good time. I did want to shift gears a little bit because we are 37 minutes in and I haven't actually got to a clip yet. So, um, and yes, everyone can make fun of me for that because they usually do. But I did want to shift gears a little bit because I do want to talk about, I think we've covered, um, mm -hmm. There will be more questions, but I know we've we've talked about depth, we've talked about row spacing, but fertility management is a big one that changes between these two units. And so um, I do want to go, Jay, if we can, let's uh, hop over to the one clip um, and so that we can look at some of the, fer the fertilizer options uh, for our planters and how that is changing. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll discuss uh, sort of our, our fertility planning between the two types of systems. Would that be the Mike Gretzinger clip or the... That's the... Yes. Yep. All right. Sorry. Not the sticky meters, although we can talk about sticky meters next time if we want to. It's the other one. Okay, so what, what we're looking at is basically adapting uh, a vacuum planter typically used for corn, soybeans, uh, and sugar beets, crops like that, and adapting it for use in canola, especially as we see some of those crops move into southern Alberta. 
So the main difference between a vacuum planter and say an air seeder, an air seeder will use something like rollers to distribute the seed and then uh, like a, a big rush, a big fan and a rush of air to, to spread the seed out through the openers. Whereas a, a vacuum planter will actually use plates and, it, and it'll use like a, a vacuum suction to suck all the seed to those plates and then individually place each seed as you go along the row. So the idea is that you get a little better seed to soil contact, you get a really nice perfect seed distribution and you have uh, like exact perfect seed rows. And uh, the whole idea being that you're gonna improve your uh, seed to soil contact and emergence, especially something for critical like a small oil seed uh, like in canola. So what sort of differences in emergence have you seen from these trials? So, so in this trial specifically, um, we've seen uh, the emergence change quite a bit between the air seeder and the vacuum planter. The, the first year that we did this study, we saw kind of overall about a 35% increase in emergence uh, on our 12 inch spacing. Uh, that's compared to our air drill at nine and a half. And then we saw about 10 or 15% uh, the air in, with the vacuum planter at 20 inch spacing, even compared to the, to the air drill at uh, nine and a half inches. So I think, I think the, the benefit was that seed to soil contact and the very even emergence and distribution of the seeds and just, just really good seed bed utilization. Um, and, and it's very consistent too. One of the things we notice as we walk through the field is we'll be rocking along the rows and, and you just see, you know, every plant is coming up and they're all at two to four leaf. Whereas a lot of times with vacuum planters, you might have a little waviness in the way the seeds go down and you walk through at that really kind of ugly stage that you want to avoid looking at. And you get some that are in the two leaf and some are cabbaging because they were perfect. And, and it's, it's really quite uneven with a, an air drill sometimes. What do you think is your biggest surprise? that you've seen throughout these trials? Ooh, the biggest surprise, uh, I think possibly in, in the FOSS side of things was we were trying to get a toxic effect. So what happens is you, as you increase the spacing on a seed drill, if you're putting FOSS down in that seed row, you're, the wider you go, the more concentrated the, the FOSS band is in that, in that seed row. So we were, we were trying to get up, I think on, on 20 or 30 inches, they were recommending like five pounds an acre was about the max you were gonna be able to do without getting seedling damage. And in this study, we went zero, five, 10, 20, and 40. And last year, we didn't really see any, any tox, toxic effects even up at the 40 level. So we threw in an extra 60 kgs per hectare actual p205 at seeding and and we were just walking through the plots and, and we did definitely notice on the on the 12s and the 20s at that higher 60 kgs per hectare we did we did see that kind of toxic effect where you could see less branching less less flower and pod development at that high end so we so we kind of did finally reach that peak but even at the the 20 and 40 which we thought would be pretty toxic at the on the wider spacing they, they look good and and we honestly almost saw a bit of a like a a fertilizer response at some of the lower rates so we'll have to see what happens once we start putting the data together but uh, it's only only the year two of year three so um, last year was a bit of anomaly out here um, our med hat site yielded higher than the, the dry land in lethbridge so we'll kind of have to see how things progress the next few years and what differences do you see from dry land to irrigation uh, that that's probably the the biggest difference between the trials themselves is is just going straight from dry land to irrigation um, it, it totally changed, I think, what we would recommend and what we would look at doing. So especially if you're a producer running both systems or you run only one exclusively, I think it's, it's really important to probably avoid any sort of generalizations, uh, especially, you know, especially just to, to, to exclude and forget about the irrigated versus dry land component. So that's why we threw it in there. And, you know, at the, on the irrigated sites, we could get away with like less than a pound an acre of seed on, on some of our trials, like especially with the, with the monosem at 12 inches. I think, I think 40 seeds per meter squared was our best yielding plot and 20 was pretty close behind and, and the curve almost went like reverse the other way that we'd expect. Um, whereas something like on the dry land site, as you went from 20, 40, 60, 80, up to 160 seeds per meter squared, which is like 16 pounds an acre, we really never even saw a, a dip in that yield response. So especially with the air drill. So on the air, on the air drill, in that case, on the dry land, we had a really dry year in, in Lethbridge last year and, and the higher seeding rates just kind of gave us that, that buffer and, and kept the, the yields up. But economically, I don't know how that plays out. We haven't done that yet, but you know, it was, it was very night and day between the irrigated and dry land. Did he really know how dry Lethbridge could be?
No. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, okay, so that that clip there uh, from 2017 gives us sort of um, some of the work that was done a couple of years ago. Of course, we've built on that quite a bit since then. Um, but it does bring up at least one of the questions. And, and Doug, maybe I'll start with you. Of course, one of the challenges with an air drill is, as you said, cranking up that airspeed because we're moving fertilizer and seed. So in a planter, of course, we're, we're worried most and, and focus most on seed, but we have to, of course, still get the fertility on somehow. So how are most farmers addressing that? Um, so out here where guys are using a corn planter, we're addressing by either doing a uh, pre-working where they're putting all their fertilizer on at once. Some have attached liquid kits to their drills or should I say they're planters, and that's how they're getting in and they're placing it away from the seed, just because it's such a small area where the seed is going in. Uh, but the majority of nitrogen is either being broadcast or banded prior to seeding. And that's how they're accomplishing it. And that adds another, we'll call another operation to the equation, you know, and that's where guys are looking at costs, right? Versus a drill, which you can basically all in one. Mm-hmm. Horst, how lovely would it be if you could get everything done in one pass? Well, I, yeah, for sure. I mean, we could all dream, I guess. Um, <laughs> on, on the soybean side, though, you, you remember, of course, that if your soil test is in a pretty reasonable place for both P and K, we don't have a big bump in extra fertilizer for the soybeans right and so you get into asking the question very quickly why put any fertilizer through the planter right if your soil test is in a good place like i'm i'm all for fertilizing soybeans i think that's how we're going to get to you know big yields consistently it has to be part of it but the the planter spring applied starter fertilizer story is still not really figured out in soybeans i mean we have done so many trials over the last 20 years and our response to be honest has been pretty mediocre if the soil test is good if the soil test is poor then there's more to it right so uh, i would say most growers are doing the right thing and we're ignoring that whole question of of putting fertilizer through the drill or the planter and and you get into the seed safety side of things and we also know that you know two days of extra or earlier planting or a week earlier is far more important than putting down a little bit of pee uh, through through the, the drill, right? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, yeah. you are talking soybeans that are gonna fix their own end and canola, which is a huge end user. So unfortunately not apples to apples. Yeah, and, and we, have, we do know that from research is that canola does benefit from some soil or should I say applied pea with the seed. It mm -hmm. usually equates to a couple of days earlier in the fall and usually a couple of bushels an acre just by having seed mm -hmm. placed just because of phosphate availability with these colder soils in the springtime. It's just not there. Your, your soil test may say it's there, but it's not available when the soils are five degrees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, very different crop, right? I mean, I think that's what it comes down to. It's just a, a different crop, so different challenges, which brings up this issue too, Lindsay, of of you know we kind of talk about a, the specific crops here as though they're in a silo the, the biggest issue we have with some of these equipment choices is that we're trying to plant a bunch of different crops right um with the same piece of equipment and so that's why a lot of growers here in ontario still have a drill because they're you know dare i say it they're still wasting their time with winter wheat and so you know <laughs> I know, I'm just you, being bad. You really know how yeah. to make friends, don't you? Yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. I gave up on making friends a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, it took, it took us this long, yeah, to get this far into the show. No, it is true, right? I mean, here in Ontario, it's far more common, or you you hire out the, the one you don't have, but you still do, right? Corn and soybeans go in on the planter, and the drill tackles the wheat or any other cereals that you might be crazy enough to grow. Um, and But I think, Doug, it's sort of the the for western canada often it's sort of the reverse it's that most everyone has the drill but in those areas where corn and soybeans have worked their way in you start looking at exactly that what else can we do with this to yeah. actually you know justify the cost and the change because change is hard 
Exactly. And it comes back down to is, is that if you're going to, if you're already growing corn and or soybeans, it, it's a natural fit if you do things right and set up properly with the proper plates that a planter can work, but it takes some, it takes some, I know you have a guy on here that likes the mechanics. It takes some mechanics to get everything right. So mm -hmm. for me, it, it's, um, it still comes back down to is that you can grow any crop you want with any piece of equipment is what, what are you going to do to make it the most precision? It's sort of that good, better, best scenario. Like mm -hmm. probably the best is a corn planter. Okay. But if we don't have a corn planter, what can we use? Right. And, and you can apply that to all crops, but it, it's still boiling back down to is understanding the agronomics of what you need to do to achieve maximum yields. And if it means seeding at a heavier rate, there is a cost to that. But is that more beneficial than spending, let's say, $100,000 on a, on a planter? That's a lot of the discussion that goes on right now. Yeah, that's true. Um, the uh, So, so Horst, your comment has, of course, brought up a few comments in the, in the comments as well. In the, thank goodness Peter's not here. He's on his way to Montana to speak at an event down there. So, yes. Um, but there are a few other questions that, as our time ticks down here together, I do want to tackle. So, one of the things I do want to quickly touch on is that maturity question. So, Doug, um, I will ask you in, in just one moment, of course, just how many days we could be talking about with canola when it's branch here, that sort of stuff. But there is a question here on what is your thoughts on narrowing rows to speed up that maturity? So I'm going to assume that's if it's late and those sorts of things. Is that a smart thing to do? Tighter seed spacing and soybeans to speed up maturity. Horst? Oh, so, I'm sorry. I was thinking only about canola. There is no such thing with soybeans. Um, this is okay. a canola, an issue. Yep. Yep. Okay, perfect. Okay, so Doug, um, as you mentioned, of course, as we make those rows wider, canola loves to branch. As you branch, yep. you're going to add days. How many days are we talking if we're talking, say, 30 inch rows or 20 inch rows? Well, tell me what August is like. Um, <laughs> you know, it can change. Um, you can see here where if we get the nice heat, uh, if you look at what we had here last summer in Western Canada for the heat that we had and everything else, probably maybe one, two days, but I've seen as much as five. Um, it, it, there's a lot of things that will throw into that. Like, did the plant start to flower and then all of a sudden it got hurt? And like, there's all these little things that are. <clears throat> oh, Doug. I, I mean, I, I think as, as we get Doug back here, I'll just make a comment too about, uh, you know, that branching and those pods maturing later. You might think, well, isn't it possible that that's true in soybeans as well? It is a little bit, but because of the photo period effect, you remember we can plant soybeans a week later right beside the original stand and they'll mature within a couple of days. So soybeans, because of that photo period effect, really don't express what Doug is getting at there with that, that variation in, in, in uh, maturity based on row width. Yeah. They are a bit odd horse. I'll give you that. They're, they're, a, bit, they're a bit strange in that way. Okay. Um, yeah, exactly. So, and yeah, go ahead, Doug. Sorry, I, I froze, and I don't know if you guys can hear me when I'm talking, when I freeze up, or what's going on, but I just wanted to add is that when you start looking at the row spacing work that was done by uh, Kutrin and a, a, a few other people out of Ag Canada, ideally, canola still, ideal row spacing is at nine inches. Um, a lot of guys, even seven inch, but nine seems to be that ideal number for even cereal crops. When you start getting to 12 and 14s, you start to play with maturity, and they, they discover that in all the cereals and canola. So it was some interesting, some interesting stuff from Ag Canada, and this was done about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. hmm. Now, um, before we get to Doug, there are several questions on what exactly is behind you in your man cave slash office. Um, and so we will get to those in a minute, I promise. You can come up with your best excuse for what it is. But um, Jason Vogt here shares that I have a grower that planted wheat, oats, canola, and soys with a Concord air drill, 55 feet, 10 inch spacing, justified uh, 15, 30 inch planter in two years. So um, it can be done, obviously. Uh, Warren did have a good question about 
uh, row cleaners. How important are row cleaners on a planter for soybeans in no-till, which is not really possible with a drill? How important are they, Horst? Well, <clears throat> I, I think it comes down to how much residue you have. If it's truly a no-till situation, in, in my little world, I mean, I, I do most of my plots now with some form of um, pre-tillage with a little bit of, uh, you know, just a coulter type one pass unit in the spring. And, uh, and the reason I do that is because, of course, I'm trying to level out all the bumps and, and also deal with the residue. Before that, I had one coulter in front of the row to throw the trash to the side and that seemed to work just fine. I did not need a row cleaner with 15 inch rows. Um, I did try row cleaners. The problem is in, in a no-till situation in 15 inch rows, you end up throwing the trash from one row to the next, right? And you end up uh, not really helping yourself out a lot. In 20 inch rows, uh, there probably is enough room. So I would say, um, how important is it? There can be a benefit. Um, I, I like to see that roll clean for the, the soybeans because it really is the residue that's the problem, right, in terms of a plant stand. So I sure am not in the camp that says you don't need a coulter, you don't need anything, you just drive right in on top. I, I personally am not in that camp. Okay. Uh, no, Doug, good question here on uh, planting canola. Even just in general, talking population like corn and soybeans as opposed to pounds. I mean, even in that video, we talked about pounds of seed versus number of seeds, those sorts of things. Are we moving? Are we getting to our thousand kernel weight? And I'll add to this, what are seed sizes looking like for 2022 <laughs> seeding and plant? <laughs> are they as big as soybeans? Yeah. Okay. One at a time. Yeah. So I guess what it is is that the traditional is five pounds an acre, five and a half pounds an acre. We are starting to see guys, even with drills, start to go into seeds per unit area. And that's what I'm trying to get a lot of guys to go to. I have been for the last number of years. Is that, you know, your TKW, you know, hopefully you've done your homework and you know your seed survivability. Uh, and that's from going stand assessments in the fall uh, after your first pass. And you can make basically a good assumption that under these conditions, I'm getting 70%. So it comes back down to seeds per unit area. And that way it gets away from that pounds. And so what you might find on the larger seed size, you might have to bump up or bump down. It all depends upon how things you're looking at. I do know that on the seed size this year, uh, everybody's got big seed. And it's part of the growing conditions of Southern Alberta where most of the seed production is occurring for all the major companies. And so seed size this year, there is some, we'll call it Saskatoon berries and some big grapefruits out there. So, um, and that's, again, that's going to play some role too, is that one of the things with the planter is, is that if you do get bigger seed size, which most uh, guys that do own drills, they want that big seed size, but guys that are getting it this year, you take a look at your roller system on your drills because we saw last year where in a few spots big seed was cracking on the rollers and you might have to do some work that way so you know it, it's seed size is big this year and we'd have to deal with it now we have you know we're looking at also seed size versus survivability and we do see a trend upwards the bigger the seed the better the survivability so it's it, adjusting rates based upon a comfort level to get that five to seven plants. There you go. All right. And so now please tell us what is on the top shelf behind you. If you, if you want to share, we have guesses Where? of uh, maybe a quiver or some sort of hunting yeah. equipment. It, yeah. It's my, okay. my hunt, it's my archery. It's all my archery. Oh, archery see, equipment. whoever, whoever guessed you get a hat, send me an email, lsmith at realagriculture.com. There you go. I'll send you one too, Doug. Um, <laughs> So there you go. It, I said it's this man cave, you guys. Um, anyway, okay. So so yes. Now, Horst, I mean, seed size obviously changes for soybeans as well, but it's listed on the bag. Does it ever, do we ever have like a really bizarre year where it's like super large or super small and we have to adapt quickly? Does it happen as often? 
<clears throat> well, it's, for sure, we get big differences in seed size because, you know, part of uh, the yield in the fall is really influenced by seed size. It can be up to 20%. And so the beauty of something like a vacuum planter is that we don't get too excited about seed size because it can handle different uh, seed sizes in that little cup without really changing changing your, your final seeding rate at all. Um, I would say the bigger concern this year is more around seed quality. We got to watch our seed quality because you remember the fall was miserable, right? We had, we had a good September for that seed that was harvested before it rained at the end of September into October, November. Perfect. But that seed that, that was out during all that rain, you know, there's some reports of some poor seed out there. So uh, I, I think that is a good piece of advice for all of us to be aware of, to really check that seed quality. Uh, very important this, this upcoming spring. Okay. I mean, it is everything, right? So I, I sort of feel like, I mean, the, the first pass is the most important, of course, because you, it's your one chance to get it right. But realistically, as Doug pointed out and Horst, as you said too, there's that bit of homework that has to happen before um, you head to the field to make sure that you've got your seeding rates dialed in, you've got your plant populations, you're targeting, all that sort of homework uh, done. And Doug, great point about your survivability. And it probably is a little disconcerting for from some of our Eastern friends to hear things like 20% loss just because of the equipment. But um, Welcome to the Wild West, everybody. Um, and hey, it, it's it's near drill. You gotta you gotta get it done in a day. Yeah. So there you go. And we just have and to adapt. It, I, I will add. I will add to this whole discussion, though. It, it's going to come back down to is, is that is getting that equipment ready. And uh, on a planter, for example, are all your discs all the same size? Do you need to replace some of this stuff? Those all the things that mechanically should be done, especially this year, being that. You know, you got horse talking about seed quality, seed size. We want to make sure those machines are running top notch. That's going to give us that good start to the agronomics of seeding this year, in my mind. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think, you know, from a soybean perspective, you know, if I could kind of summarize my thinking on, from, uh, on this precision question in just a few sentences, if you need a lot of plants per acre, right? You were talking about the guys out west seeding over 200,000. We have guys uh, on heavy clays in Niagara well well over 200,000 and they need it. I get that, absolutely the right decision. If you have seeding rates that are so high, the precision talk becomes far less important because you can, as you can imagine, you've just got more seed covering every little corner of the field. Where this conversation really gets interesting is when you're trying to shave your seeding rate. What did I hear? One pound in canola? Uh, like, I mean, if, you, if you're talking about, you know, I can bear one pound across an acre. Well, obviously, that's where the precision stuff comes into play. And it's similar in soybeans. If you want to get down to that, you know, exactly precise lowest number that you can get away with, then yes, absolutely. I'm a big fan of precision planters and uh, precision planting, right? Because it, it really does make a difference in that situation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, all right, we are out of time. That went so incredibly quickly. Uh, thank you to our guests, to Horst Bonner and to Doug Moisey uh, for joining me this evening. Uh, this has been incredibly informative. Uh, thank you to our show sponsor, Adama Canada. And of course, thank you to each and every one of our uh, listeners and followers, people commenting. I really do appreciate it. It makes the show a lot of fun and always more interesting. So Horst, have a great evening. Thank you so much. And Doug, uh, thank you so much for joining us as well. And um, I hope you have a great hunting season next. No, <laughs> next well year, fed. next year. But <laughs> yeah, next year, yeah. me on. This was a, this was a lot of fun. I enjoyed this. This was good. Great. Yeah, All right. Thank thanks you. So much. It was a good time. Thanks. Okay. All right. And of course, 
Remember, everyone, that you can head over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists uh, to collect your CEU credits. We'll have this up um, starting on Tuesday, as we do every week. Anyway, thank you to all of you. Thanks for joining me. This was a lot of fun. Great way to kick off the year. Um, I know I missed a couple questions. So anyone, uh, if you do still want your question answered, zip me an email, lsmith at realagriculture.com. I will be sure to pass it on to our guests. Um, and if you've got um, a particular guest you'd like to see on the show or a particular topic you'd like me to cover, same thing. Zip me a DM on Twitter, send me an email, let us know, let somebody at the team know. Uh, we're always looking for guest ideas um, and topic ideas as well. All right. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next week, Monday, 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on The Agronomists. Cheers, everybody.